Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Bazanka and Scott Park. Silky Smooth Sounds of the Green and Red Podcast, coming to you with Scrappy Sunday. I am Scott Parkin, your co-host in Charlotte, North Carolina today. And as always, I am joined by... I am Bob Bazenko, as always, in Houston. Are you feeling scrappy right now? I'm feeling pretty scrappy. Feeling pretty it's, scrappy. You know, it's yeah. Scrappy They're... Sunday. It was just Earth Day, so it's... Uh, there's a lot to be scrappy about. The world is it's... in in scrappy shape, man. It's in crappy <laughs> shape, but we need to be scrappy about it. So It's, um... it's crappy, and we need to be scrappy. That's what's going on. <laughs> so we're going to start with a little bit of our... Uh, which we hope to make a feature, kind of this this week in history kind of stuff. So I have three or four things that I'll just briefly mention, which I think as lefties, we should be aware of, right? A lot happened this week, big week, big week in history. Um, on April 20th- In radical history, in radical history. Radical history, yes, yeah, so we'll see only kind of matters, right? April 20th was the famous Ludlow massacre in Colorado, where Rockefeller sent his goons out to attack an encampment where they killed well over a dozen people, women and children. They just incinerated them. And it was really a, uh, one of the, I want to say high water marks, one of the, the most you know dramatic uh, uh, incidents in that entire period of violent class warfare that starts like in the late 1800s, the late 19th century, well into the, like to the little steel strike, right? Mm-hmm. And Ludlow is huge in that. And it just shows the, the, the depths to which the ruling class will go to destroy people and kill people who get in the way, right? Yeah, I mean, they opened fire with machine guns and set tents on fire, burning. Yeah, they and a lot of people were like kind of hiding, you know, and they just incinerated them. So, so yeah, pretty freaking scary. Ch- women and children. Women and children. Yeah, I forget what the death count was, like you know, twenty or something like that. Just horrific, you know. Yeah, I've been there. I've actually seen it. There's a nice kind of a little memorial there if you ever in uh, southern Colorado to check it yeah. out. Nobody was prosecuted for it. No, no surprise of there. Not. Of course not. No the, surprise uh, there. There was a government inquiry that, you know, was a, a whitewash as, as always, right? Um, April 21st, 2003. Hey, but we have the most pro-union. We have the most, now, pro- he, well, it's got to be true because he tweeted it out. I am the most, pro- I'm not going to lie because it's a bold thing to say. <laughs> Ask the railroad workers how pro-union he is, you know, or he's just a freak and I've, I've kind of gone off to, I mean, he's adult. He really is just, and he's running for re-election, right? What is it with yeah. the Democrats? You know, they, they're afraid to like, you know, just like confront like RBG or, or Feinstein or Biden and just say, hey, look, you know, we're going to send you fishing with Al Neary because yeah. that's always been my solution to things. You go fishing with Al Neary. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. kind of a, a it's kind of a cultural thing with me. So <laughs> or you could put him, or you could send him out in the car with Silvio. Right. So yeah. you're going to take a ride with Silvio. He's going to take, take a ride. To, Silvio, to his... Silvio will pick you up. Maybe I'll pick you up and I'll take you to visit Chrissy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I you, go, right? I, you know, in, in a way, I guess that's the, an homage to the going fishing without Neary. Is I think so. I think Silvio, I Silvio will pick you up and take yeah. you to, to the hospital. Every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in. <laughs> uh, April 21st, 2003, 20 years ago, the great uh, Nina Simone died. And um, Nina Simone should be huge. She should be way more famous than she is. Um, I mean, not only was she just this amazing singer or blues, but she had like this great political life as well, uh, active in everything. Um, Her song, Mississippi Goddamn, teaches you as much about uh, the South um, in that era as like any long lecture would. And so uh, rest in power, Nina Simone. Two uh, very important birthdays on uh, April 22nd, uh, Nicola Sacco, one of my people, was born in 1891, uh, one of the martyrs of uh, Massachusetts when the uh, white establishment there decided to go after uh, Italians uh, and anarchists in the uh, 1920s. And then uh, on April 22nd, 1870, the great uh, revolutionary Vladimir Ilyich Lenin was born, uh, one of the uh, major architects, probably the major architect of the Bolshevik Revolution, somebody whether you like you call yourself a communist or a Marxist or whatever, doesn't matter. You should be familiar with Lenin. Um, he, 
you know, was a great theorist, a great revolutionary. Uh, his work he was on, great. He was a great organizer. He's a great yeah. organizer. His work on imperialism is still vital, I think. Uh, imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, which is available all over on PDFs. Uh, also for that, I want to, uh, Langston Hughes, uh, perhaps my favorite poet along with Alan Ginsburg. You know, my dogs were named Ginsburg and Langston for a reason. So, uh, but uh, Langston Hughes wrote this really uh, great poem about Lenin. Uh, Lenin walks around the world. Frontiers cannot bar him. Neither barracks nor barracks barricades impede, nor does barbed wire scar him. Lenin walks around the world. Black, brown, and white receive him. Language is no barrier. The strangest tongues believe him. Lenin walks around the world. The sun sets like a scar. Between the darkness and the dawn, there rises a red star. It's, people don't write poems like that anymore. It's just very beautiful. So uh, rest in power and happy birthday, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Uh, April 23rd, 1971, one of my favorite events in the Vietnam era, uh, Dewey Canyon Three, a group of soldiers who were opposed to the war led by Vietnam veterans against the war, the VAW, marched on Washington, DC. They called it Dewey Canyon Three, a limited incursion into the country of Congress. Uh, it was one of the more important, I think, uh, anti-war demonstrations because it was led by these veterans, the VAW, many of them threw their medals away that day and protested the war. John Kerry threw medals away, but they were not his. They were somebody else's. Uh, but Kerry, actually, to his credit, he did one good deed in his life. He was actually very powerfully against the Vietnam War. But uh, what? <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm sure he was happy to wear those when he ran for president 20, yeah, yeah. 25 years later or whatever. I mean, it was uh, it was like the one thing he did. 23 right? was, years later. It was funny, like when the when the Swipo people came after him, it's like, dude, that's the only noble thing he did, you know, like you're getting on him about that. Uh, but uh, doing Canyon 3 is, is really huge. And VBAW is really worth knowing. And then uh, finally on April 24th, which uh, will be uh, Monday, actually, as we are now, but uh, um, was the beginning of the, the famous Easter Rebellion, the Easter Rising of 1916. Uh, Irish Republicans uh, fighting for independence um, began uh, their rebellion. It was uh, uh, these nationalists, uh, socialists led by James Connolly, um, and the British sent out, you know, like thousands of troops to, to crush them. And what I think is really, you know, uh, telling about this, this occurs during World War I. And the, the idea there was that, um, you know, we have this social solidarity or this working class solidarity that's more important than fighting these national wars. And so, you know, uh, the more I read about the, the, the Irish revolutionaries and Connolly and others, it's really, really inspirational. And uh, the British crushed them. And it also, I think, you know, cause we have a war right now, right, in, in Ukraine. And I think it's important for people like working people all over to understand that there are issues of, of kind of class solidarity globally that are important that are just being, you know, we've talked about this how many times, right? That you know, if you're going to fight for class struggle, you have to be an anti-imperialist as well. Because if not, you're just would you say if not, you're just a NATO liberal or something like that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I it, it's it, it's a, it's amazing to me actually how I, I've said this many times on the show is living in Berkeley, California. How many times you walk down the street and in one window of a house it'll be a, a Black Lives Matter sign, and then the other window of the house is a Ukrainian flag, and you know, those struggles are connected because the same police state that's killing black people in America and lots of other people is also the same imperial state that is you know, funneling weapons to, to escalate and fuel a war, holding, holding back any sort of like peace, peace talks or anything like that. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's amazing to me that the, that particularly in a place like Berkeley that has a long history of resistance to war efforts are not recognizing that. But I, I mean, I, I know it's complicated. And I also think that, you know, Putin is a monster. And we always have to prelude every conversation we have like this with that. But then, you know, U.S. empire rolls on and fuels these proxy wars to, you know, play in their game of geopolitics or whatever it is they're doing. Sometimes I don't even know what they're doing, but, you know, whatever. They don't know what they're doing. Well, I mean, you know, if you're going to throw around 75 billion, 100 billion, whatever, in Ukraine, wow, like East Palestine just gets worse, right? People who work there who've been exposed to that are still sick. Uh, Flint doesn't have clean water, student debt. I mean, there's just crises all over America, healthcare, right? 
how many was it? Five million people are about to get cheap off Medicare because COVID is over. Did you know that? You don't have to worry anymore. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be COVID anymore, right? Yeah. So it's, it's I mean, crisis I think, is over. Yeah. Not so really. I think, you know, to support a war where the government, where the U.S. government, where Biden and Blinken are just, and, and China as well, right? Rattling these sabers against China uh, while they're just ignoring these kind of like really here, uh, serious crises here at home, you know, as part of it too. I mean, why would you prioritize fighting a war in Ukraine over, you know, helping people in Palestine, East Palestine, Ohio, or helping people in, or helping people in Palestine? I mean, people, well, forget that. That's, you know, yeah. in this country, that's never going to happen, right? Yeah. Uh, it's funny, the media is kind of portraying this now as like, oh, you know, Netanyahu is taking it into all these new directions. It's like, yeah, I guess, but, you know, this shit's been going on for a long time and you've ignored it. So, but at any rate, um, uh, hey, one thing I want to say about the Easter Rebellion, which is to put us on this tangent, the only good, the, this, my, a new slogan I have is the only good Republican is an Irish Republican. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I just want to close with that. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I uh, some years ago, I just started reading Connolly more than I ever did before. And now I'm just like this, like total huge fan of his, you know, yeah. just like really, yeah. and the Irish Republican, the Irish revolutionaries are really interesting guys. So. Anyway, so this is Scrappy Sunday where we talk about stuff that normally we wouldn't talk about. And since it's Earth Day weekend, uh, we're going to start with Scott, who has a few thoughts, not just on Earth Day, but he recently did another media uh, appearance talking about uh, uh, the left's uh, uh, new infatuation with nuclear power. And this yep. is something that makes us kind of roll our eyes quite a bit. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that because there's a lot of lefties I'm not going to say who they are, just a New York group that rhymes with Bacobin or something like that. Hackabin. Hack Hackabin. Yeah, Hackabin, uh, who have gone all in, like on in their articles, Lee Snack Phillips, stuff on social media, uh, Left Reckoning. They've all done a bunch of like, and they're like basically saying, unless you support nuclear energy, you're anti-labor. Unless you support nuclear energy, you're helping the oil company. So it's gotten, you know, they're getting pretty sharp. They're throwing some elbows around. So we just want to we want to respond to that. And so Scott, uh, this is your ballpark. This is your wheelhouse. So yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, I want to, you know, it being the Earth Day weekend, I mean, there's a couple of things that I want to talk about, but the the sort of big elephant in the room that we've, Bob and I have gone back and forth with. We also talk with some of our other friends who are as anti-nuke as us, friends like Joshua Frank, who has a new book out, or now it's not a new book, it has a book out about this called Atomic Days. But, you know, um, it's really interesting how the left, mostly socialist sort of podcast, YouTube universe has be become infatuated and some even obsessed with, uh, with nuclear power, how it is, it is the, the argument is that it's, gonna, it's the only thing that's gonna save us from climate change. Uh, it is renewable energy, uh, which I can get to in a minute. Uh, and then it's, the the other the other argument which I find really interesting is uh, well in the hand of course in the hands of of capitalism of the capitalists it's bad but we need a socialist economy uh, that is going to be powered by nuclear power and therefore then it'll be okay it'll be pro worker it'll be you know confronting the climate crisis so all we have to do is have a socialist revolution that's it yeah yeah that's socialists it. or vote in Bernie Sanders I think is actually probably what they're really thinking. Um, That's everything. Every road leads to that, I believe. Every every road leads to the Sanders to the Sanders twenty sixteen, right? Well, um, I, I I do want to say a, a couple of points on this um, that I want to want to put out put out there about why we should be anti nuke. Uh, one, it is actually not a carbon free renewable energy. Uh, every step of the of a nuclear production process, extraction. Uh, the sort of refining or whatever the word is they use with the nuclear material and then the energy production in the, in the nuclear power plant and then the, the waste disposal, which takes 10,000 years. And I know that some pro-nuke advocates, whether they're with industry or with you know, socialist, socialist hacks, are saying, well, it would only take 300 years for, it to, for some of it to, to dissipate. Um, it's still 300 years. That's way more than my lifetime. Uh, and... Uh, but I want to say that it is actually not carbon free. There's, there's, uh, it, it's, it's fossil fuel intensive all through its sort of life cycle. 
Uh, and actually, even when you compare like everything that we're going to produce that will be renewable energy, wind, solar, things like that, it's going to take a certain amount of fossil fuels to produce it at this point, uh, because that's what the entire economy and world is fueled on is fossil fuels. And that's a whole other story, but we're, we're, we're totally entrenched with fossil fuels, getting us into nuclear and saying it's not carbon, saying that it's carbon free is not going to really, uh, is not going to really help or change that fact. But anyway, um, uh, back to my point is that uh, nuclear energy is way more carbon intensive than the production of solar panels and windmills and, and things like that. So I just want to kind of put that out there, um, that it is actually not a, uh, it is not a carbon free uh, energy source. Um, according to Mark Jacobson, who's a professor of uh, civil and environmental engineering at Stanford, uh, when you look at the 100 year life cycle of carbon emissions from different sources of energy, nuclear is actually near the bottom of the ladder. So one, it's not carbon, not carbon free. Uh, the other one, which I actually find particularly egregious, maybe it's one of my strongest reasons to be anti nuclear is around the, the extraction of uranium. Uh, it's actually an energy demanding brutal process. Uh, it's, it's actually in, you know, I don't throw terms like this around lightly, but it's a colonial practice. Uh, it mostly happens on indigenous land, uh, whether in the United, whether in North America or whether in Australia. Um, the, historically, the largest uranium deposits, deposits that have been mined in the United States are located in the Colorado Plateau the home of the Diné or Navajo people um, during the height of the U.S.'s nuclear weapons program, uh, where uh, something like 250 meter, 250,000 metric tons of uranium were mined. Um, there were 12,000 miners employed in the U.S. mining uranium, and a disproportionate number of them uh, were of Diné descent, about 5,000. The Diné are a pretty small population compared to the rest of the population of the country. So the fact that that you know forty percent of them or so were mining for uranium is, you know, is uh, in, in many ways it's it's this continuant continuance of a of a colonial crime. And they and and these people were treated as expendable. They were treated as you know something less than less than a person. They were paid below minimum wage. They went down 1,500 feet below the surface every day with no ventilation, exposed to radon, which caused lung disease and cancer and, and things all of, things like that. Um, it's, it's interesting to me to hear, particularly people in the, in the socialist media sphere who talk about how they are clean, renewable energy, sustainable jobs. But, uh, you know, there's this movement called the Land Back Movement. Um, there's a movement for indigenous rights and sovereignty. And if you care about the environment, how could you ever be in support of the mining and extraction of uranium? Um, and it's not, you know, it ravages the land. It's it's no no better than mining for coal. It's no better than fracking and and all of that sort of stuff as 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 far as uh, what hap as far as the uh, exploitation of, of the land goes. It's sure. it's particularly offensive to hear you know, people on in left Twitter and socialist Twitter talk about how you're anti-worker uh, if you oppose nuclear energy when they completely make indigenous people invisible uh, and, the, and how they've been exploited and suffered uh, through, you know, being uranium, mine, working in the uranium mining sector. It's, just, did, it's, kind of, it's actually disgusting. Oh, and I doubt those people even watch this show, but if they do, yeah. you know, I hope, I hope you need to reconsider your where you're coming from. How did the left come from, uh, for much of our lifetime, the, the environmental issue was solar energy, right? Mm -hmm. How did we suddenly get to the point where on the left, nuclear power has replaced solar? I mean, solar energy is not, not even discussed, right? Uh, among a lot of these groups now. I, I mean, I think, well, I think solar energy and wind, solar and wind are actually talked a lot about in, in mainstream, particularly in like liberal circles. And so there's like a big push. You, and actually when you see uh, an, another uh, sector that we like to talk about here often, which is the banking institute, the ba banks are putting like huge amounts of money into wind and solar. And so these like liberal Wall Street banks are doing that. They won't touch nuclear, 
it's what what I find interesting is, and I also will say that that I actually don't think this sort of left socialist uh, media sphere really constitutes a real as huge a portion of the left as they as they like to think they do, and as as other and as as they portray themselves as, because most of the people doing real movement work and on the left that I know are all rooted in anti nuclear movements, and and it's it's. Pretty, it's pretty fascinating to me that uh, they seem to think that it is some sort of popular, I guess it is a popular position against, you know, Jacobin podcasters, but um, it's, it's, it's interesting to me that they've, they've kind of created this counter narrative of sorts that they are, um, that nuclear is a, is, is a, is renewable. It's, it's a way to get us out of climate change and et cetera, et cetera. That well, I was on the show. I was on the show. This is reckon. This is revolution. The other day, and they posted. They posted uh, the, the episode, and the comments are pretty nasty towards me and pro nuclear. It's it's actually pretty. It's a pretty uh, fascinating sort of event because I, I don't really care about comment trolls and whether they're left wingers or right wingers. But it's in, it's interesting how they're like attacking me for not being credible because I've done climate work for twenty years. Whatever, fuck them. Yeah, I told you the other day I was sending some stuff like Anna Kasparian, who the Young Turks. I mean, if they're not credible, who is, right? Jesus Christ. But the the part two that comes out of this, which is, um, you know, as bad as like when we have environmental catastrophes here in the U.S., like you know, in, in Texas, like every year a plant blows up, or you have East Palestine, Ohio, with a train derailment, which are horrible, right? But Chernobyl and Fukushima affected like millions. I mean, Fukushima, there was there was radiation in the water in Puget Sound, right? So like. Why do you, how can you just pretend that that's like, you know, the catat that, you know, one nuclear accident is utterly catastrophic on such a scale. It's, it's estimate Chernobyl, it was one reactor that went into a, a meltdown and it's estimated that a million people have died as a result. There's the people who died from the initial meltdown, yeah. but then there's all of the people who got sick and died sure. it's sort of cascade effect. Uh, and then also the the land is it's like uninhabitable yeah. around you around excuse me around Chernobyl. At Fukushima, there were three reactors that melted down because it was hit by a, a tsunami. And the Japanese have quickly moved to have legislation where people can't actually report their illness and what and and being connected to Fukushima. And so they're probably not going to actually ever really know accurate yeah. numbers of how many people have died, but it's probably going to be more than that. The Japanese are also in a, a, a nuclear renaissance. They're actually building nuclear. Uh, nu nuclear power is actually also contrary to what the what the nuclear industry and the, the pro nuke socialist lobby says. Is that nuclear power is actually on its way out in most of the world, with the exception of like Japan, Russia, countries like that. Yeah, yeah it's. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. Um, you know, there's this old idea because you know Lenin had a slogan. What was it? Uh, Bolshevism is electrification plus communism, or something like that. What's he said in like 1915, right? And they're taking this, and, and a lot of Marxists do this. You know, like these guys wrote this shit 100 and some years ago, and they're trying to apply it to these unique objective conditions that exist in like 2023, right? And you know, if you care about the environment, nuclear energy should should scare you. And but this is like I've heard like people, uh, you know, kind of just basic liberals tell me that this is like a big issue on like MSNBC and CNN too. They're always pimping this, you know, nuclear power is the new solution and this kind of thing. So it's in the, it's in the eye. There, there's, act, there's actually goodies for the nuclear industry and in the uh, in the IRA too, in the oh, new okay. climate yeah. legislation that the, the Biden administration has. Also the same with carbon capture and yeah. uh, storage, which is also another thing that the pro-nuke left is onto as well, um, which is completely fabricated you know, Yahoo sort of technology that's really not going to ever go anywhere, but it's going to be something that's going to allow uh, industry to continue operating as business as usual because they can say that they're trying to do develop some kind of technology that will pull carbon out of the air. That's a, that's a whole other, we've, we've had, we had a show about that when we talked to Gary, uh, Gary, Gary Graham last year about CCS, but, but it, it's funny how much these supposed movement people, radicals are really a, adapting talking points and positions the same as nuclear the nuclear industry and the, and the fossil fuel yeah. industry um one other thing i want to say about nuclear power is that the the industry itself is pretty evil 
And so um, one, and, and th there's a lot of denial around this, nuclear power actually comes out of programs to develop nuclear weapons and they're inherently, they're, they're you know, they are, they are connected and, they go, and the connection goes back decades upon decades. Uh, and so in, in France, for example, uh, the, which is touted as this sort of perfect nuclear state by, by the industry and by the pro-nuke lobby, I'll just call them all the pro-nuke lobby, whether they're industry or whether they're you know, jack and then left reckoning people. But, um, uh, you know, Macron is pretty much as much admitted that the only reason they have nuclear power is so that they continue, can continue to develop nuclear weapons. And so, you know, this, this is an energy source that's also rooted in this sort of like Cold War politic around an arms race, around having thousands of nuclear weapons to use against our, you know, perceived enemies. Um, so also sort of uh, kind of important. The other interesting thing about France is despite it being touted as this sort of um, perfect nuclear state, it's the largest nuclear power producer in Europe. It's actually closing down a lot of its facilities and investing more in renewables like wind and solar. And the reason is clear because it's actually uh, cheaper to transition to renewable energy than it is to build new nuclear plants, which actually on average take about 10 or 15 years to, to build. And so our you know, clock's ticking on, on climate change and if we're trying to put a whole bunch of new nuclear power plants online, which there's only about 400 worldwide, then we're, uh, we're running out of time where we could be actually mass producing well, uh, wind is, and solar. This is part of what I don't understand too, because they keep saying like, this is pro labor. You don't have that many people working in the nuclear industry. No. Know? So the number of people who could be damaged by a nuclear accident is exponentially immensely higher. You know, so you create, I mean, that's what they used to say to Judy Barry, right? These people on these so-called socialists are saying the same thing that the, the timber industry was saying to Judy Barry. You're hurting jobs, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's, it's it's what the oil industry says to to yeah. cli climate activists too. And we're and, in the, and, we're in the and, third... I, I, and nuclear nuclear workers, at least some nuclear workers in the U.S. are in the same union as the oil workers, right? Yeah, OCA, oil, yeah, yeah. Oil, yeah, oil, yeah. coal, or what about, oil, chemical, and atomic workers. Is that still it? I think they have a different name now, but it's kind of used to be a very militant union too. Very yeah. radical union. That's where years. that's where uh, Tony Mazzocchi. Tony Mazzocchi, I think. Yeah, yeah. Mazzocchi yeah, yeah. comes out of yeah. But we're in the third decade of the 21st century, and you have people who call themselves socialists who are supporting a NATO war in Ukraine, and they're demanding solar energy. It's uh, nuclear. It's pretty, they're demanding nuclear, nuclear energy. Not they de I think they demand solar. I will give them that credit too. But well, yeah, but we want solar, but it's okay to have nuclear. It seems kind of like you're defeating, you're deflating your own argument there, right? It does. It, I don't get it, but there's a lot of stuff I don't understand. So yeah, um, hey, I, ha I have another Earth Day story yeah. that I want to touch on. Should I should I do that? Yeah, I was actually going to segue in. I don't know if you're going to talk about Atlanta now or later, but okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. The the other the Earth Day, other Earth Day story I want to say for Earth Day weekend is around Cop City. We've we've right. done a, we've done three shows on this now, I think. Um, but a uh, this also kind of segments with or intersects with some of the. Uh, anti-cop stuff we've been saying lately, but uh, Torta Gita, who was the forest offender who was killed in January, the official DeKalb County, Georgia autopsy came out. Uh, turns out Torta Gita was, we've known this all along, murdered by police, but he, it, it we, turns out that Torta Gita was shot 57 times. There were 57 bullets in Torta Gita uh, when the medical examiner did their, did their autopsy. Uh, contrary to what the Georgia Bureau of Investigation have said, is there was no gunpowder residue found on Tort's hands, despite police saying that Tort shot one of its officers. Uh, and leading... we, we now know that that was friendly fire from a different, yeah. from other and ballistic stuff, yeah. And, and there was you know, body cam footage from the Atlanta police, the Georgia State Troopers, who are actually mm -hmm. the ones who executed Tort to Kita. Uh, but they caught on body cam talking about how the Georgia state troopers had shot one of their own guys. Yeah. Uh, the DeKalb County ME is ruling it a homicide. Um, I'll say in the now three months since Tortiquita was murdered, uh, what the Atlanta politicians and prosecutors and cops have done is they've charged dozens of people with domestic terrorism, cracked down on activists trying to protest in Atlanta. Stories of five elderly people out flying in downtown Atlanta and they can get surrounded by this Atlanta SWAT team. I mean, this is the sort of overkill 
that we're kind of, no pun intended, that we're really kind of seeing uh, when people are resisting. And I also would say that the Georgia authorities and the Atlanta authorities know they've really fucked up with this. And that's why they have responded in such a like harsh, brutal sort of way. Whether it's murder in Puerto Quita, whether it's charging people with domestic terror, or whether it's just the sort of violent crackdown they've had on like nonviolent protest. Um, and then they, the domestic terror law, we talked about this on one of the shows, but I just want to bring this up again. That law was, the one in Georgia was actually originally written after Dylan Roof had shot up uh, and killed uh, 18 or 20 people at a, a Charleston, South Carolina black church. And they had passed that legislation to respond to right-wing terror shooters like that. But as civil liberties groups pointed out at the time when it passed, is that it would be used more against the left than the right, and that's actually proven to be true. I also just want to note that at least 19 states have now enacted anti-protest laws in the U.S. Um, I also want to say that, you know, it being Earth Day is, it's a, it's a weekend where you have a lot of marches, you have a lot of protests, you have a lot of corporate marches and parades and things like that, but um, this is also a moment where we should think about what we're willing to do to change and challenge some of the institutions that are destroying the planet. And so I'm gonna actually end my Earth Day rant with a quote from Utah Phillips, a uh, folk singer, who's one of our, our favorite, one of my favorite folk singers, Bob probably likes him a lot too. Uh, yeah, I've seen, I saw him a few times when he was alive, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I did too. Uh, Utah Phillips said, the earth is not dying, it is being killed, and the people killing it have names and addresses. So it became a popular rallying cry, is still a popular rallying cry. So happy Earth Day, everybody. Fuck nuclear power, fuck Cop City, and long live Utah Phillips and yeah. Torta Gita. Oh, and also today, this actually Scrappy Sunday. Oh, yeah, I, this is a very important thing. It's also Torta Gita's birthday. They would have been 27 today. And oh, so wow. also, and so just a happy birthday to Torta Gita. You know, as soon as that story came out, it just sounded like, you, you, you know, it was the script, right, that the police always have, and, and it's unraveled. But, you know, they're putting on the full court press. They're getting all these kind of Atlanta politicians, these Atlanta bourgeoisie, many of whom are African-American, and they're trotting them out, you know, to kind of portray this kind of broad-based alliance to, to really um, destroy. I mean, this is something the left should be deeply concerned. About. Everyone should be deeply concerned about when you start charging people. I mean, some of these people, the evidence was like they had mud on their feet, right? Or they had a hammock in the woods, and that becomes a, a charge of terror. Their, their shoes right. were wet because they their walked through were, a creek. Right, right. Yeah, so it's it's pretty it's pretty bad. And uh, this is something that should be getting way more um, mainstream or even like left. You you watch, you follow left media more than I am, but I haven't not seen this like focused on and emphasized as much as I think it should be. No. Uh, because it's, you know, I think initially there's a sense, well, we don't want to defend people like that, but you know, like shit, these are, these are who you defend. These are people who are out in there you know, literally putting their bodies on the line and, and to get, you know, these, these are, our, these are, our, these are our people. I mean, yeah, I, I find I it interesting that the, in the socialist world, they won't actually, they don't actually talk about anarchists and people doing anarchist direct action that much. And well, and, the court reminds me so much of like Fred Hampton, you know, yeah. where you just go in and you just like destroy, you blow somebody apart and you come up with some bullshit they shot first, you know, and yeah, uh, uh, I mean, the tort thing is, it's, it's amazing, too, because after the summer of 2020, police, they're doubled down, right? They're on video. They know that this shit's going to come out, right? And they just don't care. They just don't care. I mean, you know, just this week, we've had, what, an 85-year-old guy shot a kid in like, Kansas City. 65-year-old guy killed a young woman in New York. Uh, somebody delivering for Instacart was shot at because they went to the wrong house. Cheerleader got in the wrong car, got shot. I mean, this country is angry and armed and you know and, and out of control out of control man it's truly dystopic and the police you know the more mayhem they commit the more sociopathic shit they do the more funding they get you know biden is all in with the cops and all these mayors and so um actually i that could be a segue i don't know if you have anything else to say. I, I don't have a lot to say but i just saw a story today about portland which kind of fits in with that right because portland no. was i mean that was kind of trump's uh Trump, that was shorthand for everything that was wrong. Remember, Trump was always talking about Portland and the Marxist in Portland and so on, right? And the, the, the anarchist, what were the anarchist cities? There was, there was a, 
there was well, a term was, he used. Oh yeah, well also, but in Seattle they had what did they create that that like alternate city or something in Seattle? They had a, a yeah like a, a free a free zone or yeah, the, but in Portland, Cap, Capitol I mean, Hill free zone. Or something yeah, but like Trump that. was going off autonomous zone, autonomous, yeah, autonomous zone. But Portland was like every day Trump was talking about Portland, right? And anarchist jurisdictions is actually anarchist jurisdiction, right? And Anar anarchist jurisdictions, by and and real they kept saying like you country. know. It was funny because I kept like, oh, the mayor's not doing anything. He's like, I mean, the fucking mayor, like, they, they were attacking me. They were attacking the wall of moms. They were attacking everybody. They're slashing water. They're arresting people. They're flashbanging people. They're fucking smoking people out, right? Uh, actually, I don't know if we want to talk about Akron later, the, the story there, which hasn't gotten much publicity either. Jalen Walker, uh, cops, I forget how many times they shot him. No bill, you know, none were, none were charged. But uh, in Portland, you know, there's a story today about homelessness. And I talk to a lot of people who are like, oh, I like Portland, but there's too many. And these are like good liberal lefties. Oh, those damn homeless people, they smell bad, blah, blah, blah. We got to get rid of them. So uh, they're doing sweeps in Portland. Like that idea alone, it's like terrifying. You go in and you just fucking sweep these areas where they're homeless people. Like in Houston, they'll just, you know, we've talked about that before, right? They're finding people for feeding them. Uh, one of my friends the other day said for Ramadan, he went out and brought food to people and the police wouldn't let them. You know, they stopped them. They said, you know, either leave now or we're going to ticket you, or if you come back, we're going to find you or take you in, right? For feeding people. And so they're doing these sweeps in Portland. And some of the people who are involved with this, like social workers, have said they won't participate in it and they resign. And this is the that mayor, Ted Wheeler, who Trump was going on about the market. I mean, Ted Wheeler is one of them, right? And so I think this is one of the issues you have. You know, these are Democratic mayors in Democratic cities. And and they're no better. They're really no better. There's a story today about how Gavin Newsom and London Breed are bringing the National Guard into San Francisco to crack down on the fentanyl trafficking. They've just done that in um, Austin. They brought the, the state troopers in, right? Yeah. Uh, apparently, uh, Greg Abbott's kind of uh, kind of stepped in a briar patch, right? Uh, he was he promised that he would uh, uh, pardon. The guy Daniel who Perry. killed Daniel Perry, and afterward it came out this guy basically premeditated. It. He's like, "I'm going to go out and shoot somebody, right?" So no. Abbott's going to—I mean, he's just going to lay low and not say anything. And I'm sure they told Tucker Carlson to keep his mouth shut. But I mean, <laughs> who knows if he will, though? But yeah, I mean, they get away with this because there's no resistance. I mean, how many times? That's kind of the main theme for three years. We've been saying, you know, like you can bitch all you want about Trump and those guys—they're evil and malignant and all those. The like Greg Abbott and uh, DeSantis, the sanctimonious. Trump is still trying to figure out a nickname. They're actually workshopping. The in the De -Sanctu. De Sanctimonious, I think, was one of them. Well, no, there's a new one like that oh, like a day or two ago called De Sanctu, which makes no sense. But. Right. They're actually workshopping it. They're like going through like, this is what Trump does. He figured out what nickname. Like, fuck it, I did that in fourth grade, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. You know, they, he's, he, he's, he's Democratic... got the emotional emotional yeah, intelligence of a toddler. So, but these Democratic mayors are like, you know, really, you know, like in in, in Austin, the mayor there is an asshole. And you know. I, I think I think it's I think it's really important to point out is that within these institutions, where, where the Democrats even have parties, they just roll over and play dead. Yeah, it's it's I mean, on you know, issue after issue, topic after topic, you know. Controversy after controversy. Clarence Thomas, like why, why, <laughs> you know, there's no other than in the media and within activist circles, no one's talking about how Clarence Thomas is bought and paid for by Harlan Crow, billionaire, Dallas billionaire Harlan Crow. And it's just, it's just ridiculous. I mean, but who it, only 15% of Americans think the court is credible, respected institution that should be respected. Like, and, and you see all these Democrats off the rip and say, oh, you know, there's no faith in the court. We can't do this. It'll destroy, like, fucking destroy it. Like, have, have you seen the right wing be be worried about, like, dystopian destruction? You know, like, they're fucking all they, in. They're nihilists. They, they, they route their people up to go storm exactly. the Capitol. Go after, like, you know, but when you see, like, the squad saying, oh, we need to impeach Clarence Thomas. Like, yeah, that's a great thought. That, that'll that happen when, you know, like, you know, when uh, fucking squad. monkeys fly out of my ass, right? <laughs> because like you can't impeach him you need votes and you can't do that so you make his life miserable right you have investigations you harass him you go to his neighborhood although wait i forgot biden said oh no we're not gonna let you protest in their neighborhoods anymore right yeah, but it's just it's in, it's unreal the way they just they just you know look at now with with the, your your senator fine your senior senator feinstein right 
Yeah. Like the woman is like, no, not to be mean, but she's she's adult. She's got dementia. She she introduces herself as mayor of San Francisco recently. I saw I saw somebody was talking. Like she she kept talking to him about like I'm the mayor of San Francisco. And they won't force her out. And the GOP won't let the Democrats replace her on the Judiciary Committee. And they're like, oh, they're terrible. Like, why wouldn't they? Like, fuck, you know, yeah, they are scum, but like, why wouldn't they? Yeah. You know, like, do does a Republican ever have to sit back and think like, uh-oh, if I do this, what's going to happen? No, they know nothing's going to happen. You know, yeah. with Merrick Gelding, you think he's going to do something, right? I mean, it's been two and a half freaking years almost since January 6th, and nothing's come of it. And that just emboldens you. It gives you oxygen. They're not going to do anything. The Tennessee, G as we talked about in the last Scrappy Sunday, the Tennessee GOP kicked out two young Black legislators yeah. who were brought back, yeah. but still... No, no repercussions. One of one of the Tennessee Republican politicians quit, but that's because he was caught harassing interns. Uh, I mean, it's 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 there's there's just no there's no rap there's no you know nothing bad happens to them when they because they do this. There's there's no like resistance within that framework. I mean, no. you definitely have resistance, but you know it helps when you have. Like I was said, like Vietnam. Like tweets, right? tweets don't count. No, either. no. Like in Vietnam, like I think the anti-war movement performed a vital service, right? But it really helped that you had George Cannon and William Fulbright and Hans Morgenthau and Bob Packwood and James Gavin and, and these people attacking the war because yeah. it just like created this, this better environment so that people in the streets or people like you and me could do that, right? But now, I mean, we're not just like taking on the ruling class, but the Democrats, these alleged liberals, are in the way as well. Which is why you have to get rid of them first. You know, my when when Daniel Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers, and the Nixon administration was suing the New York Times and the Washington Post and whoever else to stop the publication of it. Mike Gravel read the Pentagon Papers to the con for the congressional record. Now, oh, I'm sorry. Who, what what politician would do that now? No, exactly. Like you have this new leaker to share, right? And and. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Gates and all these people are making a hero out of him, right? And I, I mean, it sounds like the kid is in this right wing atmosphere, with whatever. But you know, anybody who leaks information, I, I have no issue with that, right? I mean, that's when the government's doing illegal things or involved in these wars that you don't know anything about, then that's that's great, you know. And what gets me though is all of these Democrats like Ro Khanna and all these like the squad are attacking her. And, you know, if you want to do it, that's fine, because she's used to, I mean, the only reason she's doing this is because of Trump, right? If mm -hmm. if the tables were turned, she would want the guy, you know, executed or something like that. But, um, you know, like, when you have a bunch of people on the left or whatever, the nominal left, attacking you for being a traitor, you know, or, or that's insane. Like, this fucking patriotic fervor comes in and sucks them in. And, you know, they would have, I mean, what would they have done if they'd been around? And and uh, when Ellsberg released the Pentagon paper, what would they said about him, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean they, it's, they a, it's a shame. Marjorie, that I know... will say this too, though. Marjorie Taylor Greene defends Assange. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's it's sad that we know, at least within the institutions, we don't really have an anti-authoritarian left anymore. Huh. I mean, it, we have an anti-authoritarian right, which is wing nutty and racist and yeah, sexist I mean, and yeah, transphobic or clear, whatever. Yeah, Marjorie Taylor Greene is... Wow. I mean, there's just so much there. Right. But, you know, when when somebody says, you know, you should release Julian Assange, like I, I agree with that. I don't care who the hell you are, you know, because yeah. to me and the squad for I think I think Rashida Tlaib has said that and AOC's probably said it, you know, so but it's there's damn few. And, you know, damn well, the Democrats like Biden and Pelosi and Sh little Chucky Schumer and, you know, all these people, they they want Assange dead. I mean, that's their goal. They wanted to die in in in, in custody there, you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, to me, that's just the basic principle of life. I mean, you know, we had Seymour Hirsch on a few weeks ago. I mean, that's how Hirsch does his work, right? Mm -hmm. What gets me is the Washington Post has put some of those documents that this to share elite. They put those in the Washington Post. Why the fuck aren't they being arrested? That's the <laughs> same. I mean, the New York Times put a bunch of assigned stuff on, you know, the, the New York Times and the Washington Post published the, the Pentagon Papers. Like these media and the media helped get to Shara. They were they worked with the government to you know un, uh, you know uncover this guy, uh, which is just it's insane. The media is not supposed to be fucking doing that. Discord, the, Discord turned over all the all the yeah. files and, and, and shit uh, too. Was it Bellingcat? 
a journalist from Bellingcat apparently helped, you know, well, remember, I mean, fucking um, Eric, Eric Toller, I think is his yeah, name. Yeah, and, and, you know, what's his name? Uh, Greenwald, uh, you know, who had done some decent stuff, but, you know, Greenwald flipped on, uh, you know, he basically turned reality winner in too. Yeah. So when Greenwald and Taibi and all these people talk about, like, you know, shut the fuck up, you know? Yeah. Like, there's plenty of shit you could go after Twitter about. You know, I don't see them bitching when Twitter shuts down Antifa or it's going down or Code Pink or, B, you know, BDS stuff. They don't fucking say a word. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't really give a shit about Hunter Biden. Like, I could give a flying rat's ass about Hunter Biden. I don't care about that. Who cares? Fucking children of the privileged always have business deals, for Christ's sake. You know, like it sucks, but you know, like fuck, if, if you're gonna start going after that, man, you gotta get everybody, you know. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean the Democrats don't go after Jared Kushner the way that the Republicans go after Hunter Biden. Yeah. And he's only got two billion dollars from Saudi. What yeah. what's wrong with that? <laughs> what could go wrong? Has haven't they offered you two billion dollars? No, I'm what sure that, that if Trump ever has to flee the country for being indicted, I'm sure he's going to go live in one of his hotels in Saudi Arabia. Saudi, yeah. Saudi Arabia. weren't weren't we uh, negotiating with uh, the Saudis about the green and red? Like, uh, yeah, they were going to be on state TV there. And state, it, it, state it did, TV <laughs> didn't it didn't really work out. Yeah. Just, we'll just leave it there. Yeah, well, maybe uh, Rupert Murdoch. Now that he's free, and and a, and a word of sympathy for Rupert. He's just got to be heartbroken right now. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, I lit a candle for his his little broken heart. I mean, you know, Jesus, this, you know, I thought the guy finally got it right after what four marriages. You, know, so. <laughs> you got to give him credit, though. He doesn't give up. Uh, he's he's out there looking for his future ex-wife right now. You know, just like many of us are. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I uh, there's only one other thing I was going to mention, but do you have something? Uh, I, 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 I should pop my yeah. shot. Yeah, um, this isn't much, and, and we're actually prepping to do a big show on it, but this is something that if you listen to us, this is something we harangue about all the time. Uh, Bobby Kennedy, Robert Kennedy Jr., Bobby Kennedy's son, has announced that he's running for president. Uh, and, you know, he's a COVID denier and all that, and an anti-vaxxer and all that kind of stuff, so we can, you know, whatever. I mean, I think he's nuts, right? But the part, and a lot of people have said that, but the part that, that I want to focus on right now is because a lot of the conspiracy theory people love this because when he announced he's basically come out with an anti-intervention, anti-imperialist platform, which I actually agree with, right? But he said, you know, the CIA killed my uncle because he was going to, you know, get out of the Vietnam War and in the Cold War, and they killed my father too. And all these people are going batshit over that. Like, like, like this stuff is is really getting out of control. Like conspiracy theory has taken over the left. You have that nutty Chris Parenti article about how they're after Trump because, you know, I guess he's an anti imperialist and, you know, that water the deep state, was, the deep the deep state, state is out to the deep state was after Trump. The deep state was after Nixon. When's this shit going to end? This is insane. I mean, like, we'll do a bigger show on this because I think this deserves it. And, you know, we're going to do uh, one week we're you know, summer's coming. Things will slow down when we get back. Um, it's the 60th anniversary of Kennedy's assassination. So we're going to have kind of a series of shows just on the kind of JFK myth, the JFK legend, the legacy, not just about the assassination, because there's so much out there. And this is such a, I mean, this is like, as a historian, one of my missions is like, you know, if I can bring the truth to people about their idols, like you don't need heroes and you know, JFK ain't one of them, right? Uh, but, uh, um, you know, this has kind of renewed this whole idea that I don't know where it comes from. You know, uh, one of the things that happened last week that we didn't mention was uh, the week before was it was the anniversary of the Bay of Pigs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, April 17th, so somewhere around there, uh, 1961, 62 years ago. And, you know, I think this gets missed, like the idea that, you know, Kennedy was going to make peace with Cuba. Kennedy was, you know, invaded them. He wanted to get rid of them a after the, the missile crisis, you know, because the conservatives, the, I'm sorry, the conspiracy nuts say, you know, Northwoods, when he rejected Northwoods, they killed him. It's like, are you serious? Like during the missile crisis, the subversion continued. And afterward, the United States ramped it up. There's nothing Kennedy did. And it's just nuts. And so Bobby Kennedy has kind of taken this mantle on. And you have people who should know better. I mean, not like Aaron Good and D. D. Eugenio, neither of them. I mean, they're they got the IQ of fence posts, right? But um they're the like bright as who... bright as burritos. <laughs> um Temple must ha hand out PhDs. 
Temple's poly side department was hand, must I don't know. PhDs yeah, that's, out of fucking Cracker Jack's box. That's that's something. nothing. Yeah, that's embarrassing that he's a PhD and but he's like you know he's on other media and and they talk to. I mean, people just eat this conspiracy shit up because they I. The, the whole idea of conspiracies is that you have these bad people, right? This deep state, you know, these are like people yeah. you know, are smoking cigars and bunkers or whatever, right? But that's not like the Green and Red podcast today. Yeah. But I mean, the implication there, more than the implication, what it's saying is that there are like good people trying to do the right thing and these people are undermining them, right? The deep state's under, like, who are the fucking good people? You know, like Nixon was trying to. I mean, Nixon openly, you know, signed a, a, a negotiated a, a nuclear arms treaty. That wasn't like hidden, right? Nixon had alienated so many people because he was just obnoxious. And, you know, at the time in the 1970s, what he did was shocking. Now nobody would give a shit, you know. Yeah. yeah Nixon yeah. said Watergate was a third rate burglary and based on what we've seen since then. But, you know, like the, the deep state would, would go after Trump. I mean, that's insane. Like, what did, you know, Trump ratcheted up? He like strangled. Uh, uh, Cuba even more, Iran, you know, gutted the, the the arms agreement, you know, hanged up sanctions, killed Soleimani, slammed a tomahawk into Syria, uh, uh, sanctions against Venezuela, uh, didn't pull out of Afghanistan despite the rhetoric. Dropped the mother of all bombs on the Taliban. Yeah, I mean. Uh, the biggest bomb that wasn't, that couldn't be a nuclear bomb. I mean, just because, you know, he has this bizarre relationship with Russia and, you know, has warned against the war in Ukraine. And that's not because he thinks it's bad. It's just because he's fucking insane. Who the hell knows? He and Putin have some kind of weird thing going on. But where? I mean, but these lefties are are jumping onto this, right? And like the, it's just insane. Like the Parenti thing, and all, I don't, I don't know. It's it's first. I mean, that interview. If you haven't listened to it, uh, we talked to the the great Frank Castiglione last week. He has a new book on George Cannon, and and everybody needs to understand Cannon. It's a great way to understand American foreign policy, you know, for a yeah. long period of time. Yeah. I thought it was telling, too, because remember, he mentioned how Kennedy, like, basically would talk to Kennan, like, pay in lip service, but then ignore everything he said. Like, yeah. Kennan is the peacenik in that group. So if he's getting shut out, if he's getting ignored, then that should tell you something about JFK, right? You know, uh, it's it's quite, and and I'm, you know, the RFK thing, I mean, you know, I actually right. like, I like Marianne Williamson a lot better, if you're going to, you know, have... <laughs> But uh, it, it's crazy, too. You would think the Democrats, wouldn't you think there's somebody there who would look at Biden and say, look, dude, you're 80. You know, you're not, you, you know, you don't have it like you used to. You know, the yeah. stakes are high. Why don't you just step aside, you know? And, and they're not going to do that. They're going to rally behind him. He's going to announce next week, this coming yeah. week, and they're going to rally behind him. But, but also, just to put it out there, the establishment, you know, will probably put up Harris or Buttigieg or God forbid Hillary Clinton. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's there's some pretty strong Democratic leaders out there in the country, governors and some, I don't know about any senators, but you know, and and they're gonna put up these the the, the sort of people who are in the circle right now. It's yeah. and it's like very, it's very like it 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 just it it's it's kind of it's kind of baffling. And 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 they just Run, run, run the game on these primaries. Particularly, I would actually say more within the Democrats and the Republicans, and 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 make it so that their like chosen candidate gets in. You know, in in 2016 it was Hillary, and in 2020 it was Biden. I mean, I guess yeah. Biden had to fight a little bit more than Hillary did, but still. Yeah, but they they got everybody to drop out, and well, you know, the Democrats, the, the first primary is going to be in South Carolina, and this is something I've been pointing out forever, and you know, people ignore it. The Democratic primary winner generally is somebody who wins all these southern primaries yeah. these are states that they have zero chance of winning in november so essentially like hillary clinton did that right she ran this out that was like super tuesday right in all these georgia and south Carolina. she had no chance of winning any of those but she won the, the nomination that way and that's what the democrats always do the democratic nominee generally wins a bunch of states that they have no chance of winning in november yeah and although you know, although they did win virginia and georgia last time so yeah they won in 2020 they won Georgia, yeah. yeah. And, I and, think, and Virginia. Did, did they win it in 2016 too? I think actually. Didn't they, they didn't no. win Georgia in 2016. They, didn't win, they, won, they won Virginia. They won for, yeah. 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 Well, my point is that, you know, South Carolina, zero chance of winning that. You know, uh, these, you know, like you have like Clyburn and South Carolina, all these people are, you know, in the South, like Texas, you have no chance of winning. Because yeah. I mean, that, like, uh, didn't Sanders win Texas in 2020? Or he, he barely lost it. He won California. 
Yeah, um, but he was he was ahead in Texas, but then everybody pulled out. Beto Beto came out and endorsed. Yeah, Beto came very right. Beto came out and endorsed. A bunch Biden of Democrats that, yeah. on the border came out and endorsed right. Biden. So again, Biden wins these states that he has no chance of winning in in the fall. Yeah, you know, November. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's all good. Yeah. But I think you know with the RFK, I mean the RFK candidacy isn't going to last long. It's not going to go far. But this really is oxygen to the conspiracy crackpots and. Uh, we'll do more on that because I think that's just really damaging to the left. The left shouldn't be fucking spending all its time. Left, I mean, I don't know. I uh, maybe we, I'm we do want to note how the great James DeGenio, De our own flounder, has come out and endorsed Bobby Kennedy Jr. Yeah. I just I do want to I do want to note that. I was watching Animal House for like a hundredth time the other night, <laughs> and like as soon as he appears, like ah, oh, flounder. <laughs> yeah. I'm like Trump thinking up nicknames for people, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, it's it's but it's the RFK, you know, campaign. I mean, it's not going to I don't think it's going to like do a lot, but I think, you know, it's going to give a, a lot of like oxygen to these conspiracy theorists. And, you know, RFK has played that up, you know, they and the anti-vaxxers, up. too. Yeah, well, they're they're fucking insane, but they won. I mean, they won. The anti-vaxxers have won the public debate, you know. No. Uh, so, you know, this is where we are in, in uh, 2023. It's uh, it's it's not pretty. But it's uh, it's enough to be scrappy about. And so, um, you know, nuclear power is bad. You should help the homeless out, feed them if you can, you know. And uh, remember the words of great, uh, the great Utah Phillips, the earth is, die- is not dying, is being killed, and the people responsible have names and addresses. So go out there and misbehave. And yeah. whatever, you, and, you know, act accordingly, I guess you could say. Yeah, we'll... Uh, we're probably going to take about a week off because we're both in transit right now, but uh, we will be back. We have some great stuff planned. Yep. And, yep. Uh, we have some, we have some, uh, we'll probably be a week off from Scrappy Sunday, but we do have a couple of great episodes in the works with some really we awesome have, guests. We've got some stuff coming up. We're going to have a show on the great Stockton Lynn uh, as soon as we get that organized. And we're going to do, like I said, a bunch of stuff on JFK, um, some stuff we're- on uh, more stuff on the environment. We're going to have a, a show on the, the new film, the How to Blow Up a, a Pipeline. I won't say any more than that, but it's going to be it's going to be hot, hot, hot. We'll probably so, get a uh, we'll probably get a uh, an inquiry about that, right? <laughs> yeah. What I, pe- theaters that are showing it are getting messages from like the local law, you know, from the, the, from the joint fu- from the fusion centers and the joint terror task force. Yeah, showing a movie, right? They're they're worried about the movie sparking property destruction but they're not worried about neo-nazis posting on their websites about how they're going to go shoot up clubs and schools yeah and so there's well in in east palestine um uh aaron brockovich has been there a couple times and they're putting out these warnings that that could lead to environmental terrorism aaron brockovich they made a fucking hollywood movie about her right she's also that fucking yeah that fucking train crash is the biggest act of environmental terrorism we've seen. Oh, it's time. just getting worse. It's getting yeah. worse. There've been no no action by Biden, by Buttigieg, anybody. You know, people have these like really terrible rashes, and they're sick, and they have like all kinds of like GI problems, and you know, people who work there in the cleanup are sick, and nothing's being done, and they're worried about you know, Aaron Brockovich is a terrorist, right? So, yeah. yeah. So it's it's pretty scary shit, you know. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, enjoy your Sunday. Um, yep. Hope you've uh, had a good morning and, you know, you've had your coffee and your scrappy Sunday. So now I guess you can go to church or whatever it is that you do on Sunday. Yep. So, so if, if you like us, just remember to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you're watching this on YouTube. So hit that subscribe button. And if you like what you're seeing, go to greenredpodcast.org and hit the support button or become a patron at patreon.com backslash greenredpodcast. Shout out to the Labor Podcast Network. Shout out to our friend Daniel McGowan, who's opened up a new bookstore mm-hmm. in Sayreville, New York, Tiny Raccoon Books. Follow them online and uh, give them a little love. Daniel's going to be working pretty hard at that. Uh, and uh, we'll talk to you again real soon. Take care.
wish I knew how it would feel to be free. I wish I could break all the chains holding me. I wish I could say all the things that I should say. Say I'm loud, say I'm clear for the whole round world to hear. I wish I could share all the love that's in my heart. Remove all the bars that keep us apart. I wish you could know what it means to be me. Then you'd see and agree that every 